Hello, Save Jerseyans. This is Matt Rooney, your blogger-in-chief. Uh, it's 2017. President Trump is inaugurated. If you didn't know because you watched the inauguration, you've certainly seen plenty of liberals lighting things on fire and throwing hissy fits, so that would be enough to tell you. Um, but So even though we continue to support much of what our president's doing down in D.C., we necessarily now need to pivot and focus on what's happening in our state in 2017, okay? Because regardless of how you felt about the election that just transpired, we all have to pay property taxes. We all suffer from the same consequences of a school system where the funding formula is broken. We deal with the same corruption and the consequences of it that come out of Trenton. So it's more important than ever to zero in, see what our options are in 2017. And I think on the Republican side of the aisle, initiate a very honest discussion about what kind of party we're going to be moving forward in the post-Christ Christie era. I know most of you agree with me on this. I don't even need to say it. So to kind of kick off the gubernatorial phase of our 2017 interviews, I am absolutely stoked to have Steve Rogers here today, Nutley Commissioner, Air Force veteran, and a man who is trying to shake up the GOP primary this year in New Jersey. So, Commissioner, thanks so well, much for Matt, coming. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Believe me, oh, I really uh, thank you for fun. giving me the opportunity to come here. You're a social media ace, which is something that even politics aside, we appreciate. He's been yeah. doing these Facebook Lives, yeah. and they're getting a oh, really good getting, reaction. We're getting a great reaction. Yeah. Look, my message is, is pretty simple, Matt. As a governor, as any elected official, I think our, 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 our main objective to be is to make sure that the decisions we make will help you fulfill your dreams. It's not about us. It's about the people living in this state now and future generations. So my goal is to make sure that when I become governor, I will shape policies that will make people, families in this state, make them fulfill their dreams. Uh, secondly, you know, I look at the American flag, as most of us do. We're proud of that flag, are we not? The third star on that flag is New Jersey. I'm going to make sure, as governor, that that will be the most brightest star in the 49, 50, I'm sorry, the 50 states. I'm going to make sure that that is the star that is the one that Reagan talked about, uh, shining like that city upon, from the city upon a hill. That's what New Jersey's going to be when I become governor. And you talk about us being a shining city on a hill again. I mean, that's one of the ways that I always conceive of New Jersey as being, I don't want to reduce it too much, but we're prime real estate. I mean, here we are between two of the nation's largest cities with large commercial sectors. We have all the natural resources you could hope for, especially in terms of our coastline, um, some of our natural beauty. Um, we've got some of the greatest uh, academic institutions. What you just in the articulated world. as part of all what we have right. when it comes to making that star shine. But here's what's happened establishment politics has put a dark cloud over that star. And it's uh, uh, pretty clear to me, Matt, that the establishment politicians on both sides, I, I, I make no bones about this have done more to take care of themselves than to take care of the people in this state. Well, don't you think there's really one party in New Jersey now for all intents yeah, and purposes? Yeah, it's the establishment party. That's what it is. And, right? I, and I've personally never been a rhino hunter, per se, because I think you can disagree on some issues and still be rowing in the same direction. But some of what we've seen, and I think the gas tax fight yes. really illustrates that, there's really no opposition. There's no taxpayer party. You, you, you know what, Matt? The gas tax is not just 23 cents. Yeah. I've shared with people it's much more than that. Right. It's it's causing it. We have to pay for goods and services of the tractor trailers and delivery of goods. It's always brought down to the consumer. That tax has to be repealed. And this is my point about making decisions, not fully understanding the negative impact on the middle class people, particularly in this state. I get out through Sussex County, uh, up north, Salem County, uh, uh, all the counties here in South Jersey, and I'm driving down the road looking for a place to get a cup of coffee. And as I'm driving, I'm driving miles and miles, and I'm thinking. These poor, hard-working people down here, they've got to drive miles to get to work. So even before you get to work, you spent a pretty good chunk of your paycheck at the end of the month on what? An unnecessary gas tax. Why unnecessary? Because when politicians have to pass a tax bill to fill the hole that they created, then they don't deserve to be in office. They actually took our money, they mismanaged it, and now they want us to pay for that mismanagement. Well, that's what I, I found particularly galling, too, because I've had many conversations, and i got to say, personally, some of these folks, 
they're not bad people. They at least didn't start out being the problem. But I've heard them say, oh, Matt, well, this is the hard thing that needs to be done because of all the mismanagement in the past. Without even looking at the details. Right. It, it, I'm sure you have. Uh, I always think raising taxes is easy. Yes. You know, when you blow your $20, your parents give you an allowance. The easy thing is to go and beg for more. It's harder to go out and get a job or change your spending habits or do something that's actually going to make it so you can hold on to that 20 Well, and you know what else is easy, Matt? And, and people will dispute this, but I will not. What's easy is to get business and industry back to the state, dig into the spirit of America. We have to look at the spirit of America right here in New Jersey. And you start encouraging businesses to come back. And you start encouraging people to, to get back to work. And when these new businesses come, then you're going to fill the hole without raising taxes. And I've got a couple of industries that I've talked about. First of all, I've, I've advanced this idea. I'm the out-of-the-box out of thinker, and I believe that's where you get most results. You think out-of-the-box. Don't fall in line with traditional thinking. I'm thinking about one of the first industries I want to bring back is the New Jersey movie and film industry. I want to see that as st much stronger than Hollywood. We could do that here. That in itself will employ thousands of people from Atlantic City all the way up to the northern border, from Philadelphia to the Atlantic Ocean. And there's so many films being shot in Philly and New York. You think we could pull some? Hundred, and we can. Yeah. But nobody has thought of really pursuing that. And my point is, is that you're going to get plumbers, you're going to get uh, electricians, carpenters, skilled workers. They're going to have to build the production centers. Now I was at Monmouth University this morning, and I advanced that idea, and the students were thrilled about that. They said they'd never heard something like this before, a proposal. What does that tell you? I'm looking at 20 years down the road, you know, uh, 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 20 years down the road, thinking about when I'm gone, what am I going to leave behind? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I have nothing to gain out of this. You know that. You've seen my background, U.S. military intelligence, law enforcement, seen it all, done it all. Wouldn't it be great to, to, to walk your final mile, just walk that last mile knowing that you had great positive impact on somebody's dream? That's my my thing. I want to make those dreams come true. And, you know, here in New Jersey, there's no reason they shouldn't be able to come true, but Trenton's an impediment to those dreams being fulfilled. We already started to talk about that. Tackling the gas tax, for instance, okay, which you're correct. I, they completely have understated the impact on average folks, partially by lying about how much you have to spend to get the benefit of that sales tax cut offset. Right, you have to be pretty wealthy and spend an awful lot of money in order to get something out of that. But again, they'll retort and they'll say, "Okay, what would Steve Rogers do different? What would Jack Cittarelli, Kim Guadagno, Joe Rulo do different? What would you have done differently in order to try to get the transportation trust fund back on track without burdening the people in New Jersey who are already burdened?" Well, you don't tax people. We right. could work on bringing revenue into the state, and you know, there's not enough. Look, we hear about. New York, for example, they're, they're drawing all the businesses there because of their tax incentive plans, all right? But here's how you... Which is sad, New York's beating us in that. Well, they're beating us to death. Look, when I get around and I talk to businessmen, corporations don't want to come here, small businesses can't start here. You cut regulations, all right? And, 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 and you do something really novel. How about cut some spending? Cut spending. When you have a, uh, a, a, a situation where our state says, hey, we just found $300 million to restore the state house, Hey, we just found enough money to give judges and staffers of the legislature pay raises. That tells me there's money somewhere. Why not use it for the common good of the people? So think about this, Matt. You, you start bringing businesses back, and we can do that, and I will do that. We're going to bring businesses back. you got revenue. Cut taxes. Now, people say, yeah, but you're saying, you know, you need taxes to pay these bills. Why cut taxes? Well, you cut, for, the, for example, cut the income tax. I mean, you know what's going to happen? People will buy more. I'm giving you the purchasing power. And in sheer volume, you'll be able to fill a lot of holes with that amount of income coming in. Not going to happen overnight. But it's the beginning of going through a process of cutting spending, cutting taxes, and at the same time, not placing a terrible tax burden on the people. It takes time. It takes courage to do that. The difference between me and, I, I would say, just about every candidate running for office, I'm not beholden to anyone. I'm not beholding to special interest groups. I'm not beholden to anyone who wants to influence me one way or the other. I'm a free agent. I'm a free agent. And, and, and I'm proud to say that because the only people I'm beholden to, actually there are two, there, there's one person and two people. First person I'm beholden to is to God Almighty. I, 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 I've said that. I'm not ashamed, afraid. 
to mention that I I, I, be. I believe that's right. I believe in biblical principles. I'm accountable to God for my actions, and I'm accountable to the people. And it's a great feeling to be able to get out there and say that from your heart, you know. So when you're you're accountable to people, when when I get letters and emails after one of my uh, broadcasts, my wife and I read them, and you get this this awesome feeling of my God, you know. This is like serious stuff, you know. I mean, people suffering and in pain, but counting on you. you know, You're connecting with them, and they're reacting. Yes, to you. they are. These and, are real and, people. But the heart connection, not the head or political connection, and you end up losing a lot of sleep. And you say, "My God, you know, when I get there, this is what we're gonna. Uh, the, the people are gonna count on us to deliver. I am gonna deliver. Believe me, I am going to deliver." And the fact of the matter is, I'm going to deliver because it's not me, Matt. It's everyone. It's you. It's me. It's Democrats, Republicans, Independents. We're going to come together and we're going to deliver. Well, you know, I think that there's no doubt most of our listeners are going to agree that conservatives, libertarians, those of us on the right, we have better solutions. If you need any proof of that, look what's happened in Trenton. Their yeah. way has failed. Yeah. But you raise an interesting point about connecting with people at the level of the heart. Yeah. Do you think that's what, up until at least the age of Trump, we've done wrong? Have we focused too much on, well, we have our ideas and we're very proud of our ideas, so we're going to communicate our ideas, and forget that people also want to feel as if you're with them and that they you understand them and you empathize with them? And is that something that you can inject into this Republican primary? I sure could. Look, I was asked a question about polls this morning. Apparently a poll came out, and there are two Republicans who they say are in the lead. So there's two polls. There's an Eagleton poll that they talked about name recognition yes. primarily. They mentioned Kim Guadagna, the lieutenant governor, and Jack Chitterelli, an assemblyman, two of your opponents. And then there was a Quinnipiac poll. I think it had Kim Guadagna trailing by 16 points. Mm -hmm. She was the only candidate they asked about. Yeah. So you haven't really been tested in the polls yet. Yeah, let's talk about well, the people's polls. Let's talk about the people's poll. And that's where the establishment politicians have not yet learned a lesson regarding Donald Trump's election to office. I'm out there every day. You know, I've been all throughout the counties. I'm still going... Very, I'm very concerned about the citizens who live in South Jersey. They feel disenfranchised. They haven't seen politicians forever. Here's one of them. Yeah, I mean, I mean this is something I've told them all. South uh, Jersey has been forgotten by the Republicans. It's party. horrible, and I did not sure. know that. I did not know that, Matt, until I started traveling. You're on the wrong side of the and Berlin Wall right now. Yeah, and they're hurt. They're yeah. really hurt, you know, and they feel like they don't count. Well, they've got a governor. Uh, the next governor is not only going to be there during the campaign, but I'll be there after the campaign. And I've said this to anyone, and can I look at your camera? Absolutely. Anyone who believes that I will not come after I'm elected to office, call any resident of the township of Nutley, friend or foe. Ask them what Steve Rogers did well after he got elected to that city council, to that board of commissioners. What I did was I went on a how you doing walking tour after I got elected. So you went around and knocked doors after you'd already won. 10,000 doors. It took me a year and a half to find out what issues the people were still concerned about. 10,000. And I learned a lot. Were well, people confused when you knocked Yeah, yeah. Door? They said, we just voted We already voted for you. Why are you back already? I said, I'm back to find... <laughs> I, I came looking for something, your support. Right. Now I'm coming asking you what I can do for you. They were stunned. They were stunned. I also announced when I uh, got sworn in in May of 2016, picture this. You're up there with your family, right hand up, left hand on the Bible. You announce that this is your last term. Why? Because I believe in term limits. Now, I know that I could get... Across the board? Down, for me. Okay. For me, yeah. I'm, I'm, in other words, two terms in one office is enough. Okay. All right, so now I move on to governor. But my point is, you. I believe in term limits for everyone. Mm -hmm. Local government all the way up. Okay. But that will be hard to sell when you have establishment politicians who owe so much to so many and have given so little to the real people of this They state. value their vanity license plates and there you go. stupid little perks. Uh, it's horrible, you know, I mean... Uh, I, it gets I, old, too. I, it does. It, I wouldn't mind it, it if we were getting results, but we're not. Yeah, we're not. We're not getting results. <laughs> they are. They're yeah. getting results for the special interests, but we certainly aren't. Yeah. But my point is this. When you run for office, it's a temp job. You're in there for a short period of time to do the best you could and make sure that no matter what you do, as I said earlier, you do for the benefit of everyone. And that's the key to me running, and I've been successful at that. Very successful. And um, I, I would say this, that, look, uh, getting back to the polls, I'm going to win this race. It, I know it's tough, but my fifth grade teacher always called me a dreamer. Now, I went back to see her about a year ago with my wife. 
she was in a nursing home. But I went to see her to thank her and to let her know that my success is because of some of the things she did in my fifth grade class. And I remember the nurse wheeling her and out in a wheelchair and her name is Mrs. Arthur and she was looking at me and a little confused, I'm sure. And then she's looking at me and I'm sharing with her who I am and the tears started to roll down her eyes a little and I realized I had made that connection. And I thanked her, I hugged her and I kissed her and, and, and she nodded and she did say, Steve, Steve. And I said, yes, Steve Rogers. And so we left. But little did I know that would be the last time I ever saw her because she died a week later. But you know, to me, uh, it meant a lot to let this person know, not knowing she was gonna die, uh, let her know that you affected as a fifth grade teacher, a, a, a man that has been so successful in life, that knows how to pray to God, that knows how to work with good ethics. You, my fifth grade teacher, enjoy the success as you see me advance. Thank God for the Mrs. Arthur's. Right? Oh, thank God for the yeah, Mrs. We're, we're not for them. And you know, that's kind of, it's kind of a good segue. I want to run through a few issues with sure. you. Sure. So our readership knows where you stand as they start to make their decision in the following months. And a good place to start, teachers, the education yes. system. We've got a pension problem which I think recently eclipsed Illinois and California as being the worst in the nation. We've right. got a terrible pension liability, yes. partly because Republicans, mostly Democrats, but also Republicans have mismanaged those funds. They've borrowed from them, they've invested them poorly, and now we've got this crisis that's not only driving the burden on everybody else, but also potentially shortchanging the Mrs. Arthurs of the world. Yes. So what does Governor Rogers do to begin to try to right the ship? Governor Rogers... Uh is going to look to get a constitutional amendment passed that will prohibit anyone from dipping into a pension fund to pay anything. That money is there for the Mrs. Arthur's. So is it fair to call this a lockbox? Yeah. I know yep. that's, yeah, that's a good term. I like that. A lot, but I like it's, that. it's a lockbox. Lock box. No politician's okay. ever going to be able to stick their hands in there. If they do, they're going to face criminal prosecution. Simple as that. That to me is stealing. I'd like to see people. that. Well, you know what? You just <laughs> sure might. many of you would too, right? Yeah, you just might. You just might see that. Uh, so that's that's number one, and it really should be for every lockbox. We should have lockboxes all over the place because you can't trust establishment politicians. Right. For example, I, I know we might, you might have want to talk about this later, but I'd like to bring this subject up that I'm going to bring up now in relation to this. We just saw a bill, Steve Sweeney and Singer, right, with the bail reform bill. What are they doing? They want to look at this is a backdoor way of increasing property taxes. For goodness sakes. They want to pay, they want the taxpayers in each municipality and county to pay uh, a, a higher tax because they're going to exclude the 2% tax levy mm -hmm. uh, to correct a mess that they made with bail reform. That is, to me, ludicrous, and that should not be going on. But that's how they operate. No, it's a massive, I mean, look, there's no doubt, I, I'm saying this as an attorney, there definitely were problems with our bail system as it was structured. But to make it an unfunded mandate, that aspect of it was clearly not the answer that, that, and exactly. these counties are having to hire maybe your average uh, listener doesn't even they're not even aware of this because there's so much going on that's being thrust at you all the time online and on tv but these counties have had to add so many extra prosecutors we've now added extra judges for that, um, the all to compensate for, for this for, you know what the killer is when you read the last paragraph they blame the people they tell them, they tell the people that they voted for this in november 2014 for the tax increase now they'll use all kinds of uh, 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 words and legal, you know, legal words to maneuver around it. It's an, it's a, it's it's giving them permission to increase our taxes. Simple as that. Absolutely. That should not be going on. So 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 number one, what we're going to do is we're going to put a lockbox on these pensions. Uh, number two. Additional benefits reforms. Pardon me. Additional benefits reforms. More level, a higher level of contribution from participants. Well, well, well here's what I, I think. Eventually, we know that that's going to be phased out. Okay. I think that uh, right now, people who have been uh, paying, in, in other words, people who are, who are now recent employees and those who retired, I believe in grandfather, they signed on. They, the state made them a promise right. that they would take care of them in their retirement years. But what we have to do is begin thinking smart mm -hmm. and realizing that we can no longer sustain uh, what we have here with regards to pensions. All right. So as we progress and move along, we begin to phase that out. And, and give everyone the opportunity to, to buy their own pension fund, if you will. I think that is very, very smart and very important. Now, uh, the unions don't want to hear this, but the fact that, and because, you know, I was a union president, I was a PBA president, 
uh, of a police uh, PBA local, but I've spoken to police officers and those in the pension system, and it's interesting. They don't mind giving back, but you made a promise, like the cost of living allowance. I'm committed to getting that back to retirees who were promised that when they came on their job 20, 30, 40 years ago. Any promise we made, we should keep. But now, think about this. You're a young public employee. You want to become a teacher, a policeman, or a fireman. Now, you come to me uh, as the state and say, look, I would like to have this job. So I put a piece of paper in front of you and say, well, here's it. Here's your benefits. You know, you're going to have to help contribute to health care, help contribute to the pensions. From the beginning, you know there's no promise. And you know why those promises were made? They were made by establishment politicians to get their votes. Believe me, I was on the other side. I'm almost sounding like Donald Trump. Absolutely, I correct. was a union leader who knew how to get to the politicians for my membership. But you realize as time goes on, you played the games. You had yes, to beat the game. Yes, and, and and but but here's the thing. That was Trump. Yeah. But but way back then, you know, you really don't realize the impact that what you're doing has on the middle class people. Yeah. And so now you learn lessons as you move along. So there are a couple of things that we can do. One is certainly we can begin to phase in a system that will be fair for everyone. That's number one. Number two, a lot of the money that will be coming in from our industries, as we said earlier, will we'll fill that pension uh, hole. And, and then as time goes on, health care, big, big issue, right? Health benefits. Mm -hmm. Well, again, those who have been gi given the promise, the promise should be kept. But how do we make this a win-win for everyone, the taxpayers and the, the uh, rank and file? You do what Donald Trump as president wants to do. Break down the borders. I want New Jersey uh, public employees to have the ability, now listen to this, and, and you'll know where I'm going with this, to leave the New Jersey health benefits system and go out of state any way they want to buy their health care. Isn't it amazing that that's controversial? A amazing because who's locked into New Jersey health benefits? What political entity, what establishment politician, you're smiling because you know it's the truth. Why are they being protected? So here's what happens when Governor Rogers gets in office. We get that thing passed. New Jersey Health Benefits, the board of directors, wants to meet with Governor Rogers and says, look, we'll lower the cost of health care. We'll lower it because it's killing us. Right. You see, you, ever hear, you know the show Deal No Deal? Absolutely. It would have been out of business if I was on that show because <laughs> no deal. You either do it now. There'd be no deals. It would just be called no deal. That's right. You either do it now and yeah. help the people. Well, forget about it because the borders are going to open for health care. They're paying it already, okay? And you, you can never get it back. And, and that's another thing. I've been so transparent and honest with the rank and file, okay? Yeah. I've been so so honest with them. With the There's rank probably and one of them calling you right now. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. No, no, that's okay. Them. I'm just laughing. Yeah. I mean, you're, you, uh, you've created this connection with people. Yes, yes. But Somebody my, probably asking you about what you're going to do about their health care. Yeah, so, 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 and, and the, not the unions, I'll get on that in a minute, but yeah. the rank and file are saying, okay, you know, we, we, we believe we should contribute. We just don't like the idea that we were promised something, and now that we're retired, you know what, we're left, we're really left in a bad situation. A lot of the public employees who were promised the cost of living allowances, they left, Matt. A lot of them are really near poverty level. I mean, we're talking a real serious situation. That's a loss of income. And that's a loss of skills and talents that we could have contributing to the you know, problems that we have in the state. A lot of skilled and talented people have left because they can't afford to live here. So I struck a balance. retirees have left. Exactly. You know, they're taking their pension uh, money and they're going south. South Delaware, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida. And these are people that could give back, that want to give back. Look, I'm retired, all right? So I, 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 I keep myself busy. But I've talked to so many people retired who want to help the state who want to help their fellow Americans, but because of the cost, they can't stay here. But if you're an establishment politician, uh, believe me, you'll take care of your friends and your constituents to get the little guy. So that's what I'm all about. It doesn't seem like they can keep it straight who actually is important to them and who actually gets priority. It changes from day to day. Well, and lately, they're trying to do everything they can to politicize President Trump's efforts to use an executive order to try to enforce policies which are really already in place, but not being fully enforced. He go ahead. He goes ahead and does it. We're all familiar with what the results have been. I mean, personally, I'm in the camp where I wish I he would have articulated a little better, maybe gone on TV and explained what he was doing. But if you're going to criticize what he's doing, you have to criticize what President Obama did in 2011 with Iraqi refugees and everybody else. But the reason I bring this up, even though I'd love to get your take on that, I don't know if you've seen, but today, today's Friday, 
Stephen Fulop, himself a one-time almost gubernatorial candidate, right. mayor of Jersey City, announced that Jersey City is now officially yes. going to be a sanctuary Jersey. city. He signed an executive order. I would love to know what Governor Rogers would do to Jersey City and to Mayor Stephen Fulop if they persist in this policy. If they persist in this policy when I'm governor, and that policy is law by the President of the United States, they will be prosecuted under a Rogers administration. We can't Seal have direct your Attorney General to go after Charge them. Uh, for, for, for misconduct in office, whatever it takes, they will be prosecuted. This is a law of, this is a land of laws. And if we expect the people in this state to obey the laws, then the politicians should obey laws. What they're doing, Matt, is they're taking a situation, a national security situation, and turning it into a political football for their own agenda. And I really get aggravated over that because I've worked in national security, I've worked with military intelligence, right. and I fully understand the implications of not securing our country in view of the fact that you've got the mayor of Jersey City saying that, you've got other mayors that are going to follow suit. How do you follow suit when the New Jersey State Department of Homeland Security released a report last week basically saying, we are a hotbed, we can be a target, I mean, we're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So you have to put mechanisms in place that will make sure that the people who are living here are safe and secure. Now, let me just say something. Under a Rogers administration, no, no police are going to come banging doors down and dragging families out of their homes. That's not going to happen. That's the vision that they that, paint yes. because they want to scare people. Exactly. And Donald Trump never said that either. Okay. But what we plan to do is to make sure that everyone is vetted properly. They have to be vetted. We don't know who's here, who's there uh, to suggest that we want it. we're going to bring thousands of refugees in. I've asked people all over the state. So you bring them in. Did you realize that you're going to be paying for the education of their children? Your schools are overcrowded now. What happens when 100 more children have to go into those schools? They've done a study. I think it's $2 billion yeah, annually, two billion. they estimate. Oh, and, there's, and there's some taxes that are paid, yeah. but it doesn't offset. No, it doesn't. Who's going to feed these individuals? Uh, oh, oh, well, they're going to get jobs. Well, they're going to get your jobs, you see? So, so my, they're going to get your jobs. And, 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 and here's my point. I am compassionate. And believe me, I will take my shirt off the back for anyone. But I believe that we have to think of us first. The middle class American who lives in this state, the poor people we have to think about, and about the wealthy. Look, you've heard a lot about the wealthy. They should pay this, they should pay that. But what you're not hearing, and I've been around and I've talked to some pretty rich people around this state, what you're not hearing are the endowments that they've given to our schools. You're not hearing about the grants that they provide from their families to give children like yours to, to get a career down the road. These people who are wealthy in this state, they don't brag about what they do. They just do it. And they, they you know, what about the programs? Matt, I've ran into some wealthy people who are really helping build facilities for our citizens with autism. Isn't that fantastic? Um, how do you think this stuff is getting done? Not by the establishment politicians, but by the wealthy people in this state. You know me, I'm not a wealthy guy. Look, I shared uh, last night that I almost lost my home several years ago, you know, due to great financial difficulties. But thank God I was able to pray and pull myself out. So when I run into a person who is uh, going to lose their homes, like some of you out there, who when a person says, well, I knocked on a door, you're talking about the tour. Right. How you doing, Mrs. Jones? Mr. Rogers, see this piece of paper? This is my health care bill. See this piece of paper? This is my mortgage. If I pay this, I lose my mortgage. If I pay this, I lose my health care. Now you tell me how I'm doing. You want to talk about sleep with nights? And it was an 80-year-old woman, 90-year-old woman. Worked her whole life. And this is what the New Jersey legislature, the state of New Jersey, gave her as a reward for working her whole life. That's got to stop. And it can stop. I never stop getting angry about it. Uh, I can tell you getting angry. And I mean, angry. I know close to here. nine years of, of, of doing this site, which in some ways it's felt like since we started Save Jersey, I've been running for office nine years. Not that I'm trying to get an office, but interacting with people like you have in towns around the state. It never, never ceases to, to anger me. And it also does also anger me. I know you referenced the wealthy. Yeah. How we villainize people that are successful. There are certainly plenty of people out there that have earned their monies in ways that I wouldn't approve of. Most of them have worked in government, by the way, yes. okay, with crony capitalism and whatnot. But they're doing great things, and yet we're driving them out of the state. And I know you already said that one of your number one priorities is to reinvigorate our economy. So, you know, just off the top of your head, what are, you know, three, four, five things you would do or pursue in your first 100 days to reinvigorate the economy? 
Well, first of all, I talked about bringing in business, the, the New Jersey uh, motion picture industry. Right. Uh, I want to help our farmers. I learned a lot, all right? And now, um, and you're in South Jersey, so we've got a lot of farms, yep. and they're yep. suffering. The farmers have told me that the rules and regulations have crippled them, their ability to grow uh, and, and sell. I talked about making New Jersey perhaps one of the largest um, uh, organic uh, farming industries across the country because we're buying a lot of organic foods from out of state. Now, the farmers, when they heard that, uh, they said, well, slow down, slow down a bit. You know, we don't grow organic food, but this is what we do. Right. And this is what's important about connecting to the people because I did not know certain things about how hard our working farmers we have in the state. Yeah. Do you know what I asked them to do, Matt? I've said this to everyone. Send me a policy that you would create that could help you. Right. Send me that policy because my background has nothing to do with farming, but they're the experts. So they send me their ideas and we begin to formulate a policy created by the people, not by a politician. So you don't mean you, you mean you don't have all the answers and you admit No, I don't. No, I don't. Matt, I, I, you know who has all the answers? The people I'm connecting with. That's why I'm knocking right. on doors. Right. You know, last week I'm at Tom, in Tom's River at the Crystal Diner. And I'm sitting down. It's good and, yeah, oh, great food. Yeah. And I, I'm talking to uh, all kinds of people. And there's this five or six men sitting at a table. And a guy says, Mr. Rogers, come over here. And he says, I am involved in the auto industry. Uh, almost like NASCAR. I think it was motocross, something like that. Right. And he began to share with me the difficulties and problems that that industry, I didn't even know it existed, but it's a great industry in New Jersey. And, and we got to talking about race cars and about all sorts of things. And I'm thinking, man, if we could expand this where we could get kids from out from, out from behind a computer and an iPad and let them talk to these race car drivers and get them, you know, uh, at, at the racetracks in New Jersey. I'm not talking about horses. I'm talking about cars, for goodness sakes. Heck, sign me up. You know? Yeah, you know? But, but, but my point is, I told him to get me in touch with someone higher in his industry so I could talk to him. Okay. I'm going to get the call. I'm going to set up a meeting. And I want them to shape policies that can allow me to help them. So a lot of what I'm hearing is it's, it's diplomacy. And again, this very much mirrors President Trump, who you were an advisor to, yes. right? Yeah, not him directly, but I was an advisor, you were advisor to, the campaign. to the campaign. Yes. Um, so that's that's very important. Tax cuts, I'm guessing, are going to be, or at least tax reform is going to be part of your package. Well, because and, God and, knows we pay more taxes yeah. in this state yeah. per capita than any state in the country. Yeah. Tax cuts are, are a necessity to fuel the economy. Right. I'm giving you and not the government the ability to spend your money. Do you have a specific plan yet or is that something that you're going to work well, out over time? Well, I'm going to work out over time, but my plan, uh, uh, two things. I want to, when it comes to uh, fueling the economy, I want to look at and hopefully, it may be a dream, but I'm going to try. I want to really... You're a dreamer. We've been up Yeah, I want to eliminate <laughs> the Department of Education. I, I, I want to eliminate that. It's, it's, no to me, it's an employment agency. I want to get ed education off the backs of our educators, off the backs of our parents. Matt, that's why you have PTOs and PTAs and elected school boards. You, you, you defeat a local school budget three times in the state, and the State Department of Education comes in and says, Hey, Matt, I don't care about what you voted. We're going to give you at least eight. You're talking to the son of a teacher, a fantastic yeah. teacher, and I've yet to meet the politician that understands education as well as she does. Well, so... Exactly. So what, what do you have to do? As those of us involved in, in, in the political spectrum, go to the teachers. There will be no more bullying, no more denigrating, no more of, of denouncing the most important investment we have in America and in this state is our teachers. Though, look, this is Arthur's, all right? I have found, you. I don't know if you're going to find this next uh, statement amazing or not, but as I get around the state and start, talk to public school teachers, what do you think the number one issue they brought up to me is? The number one issue. The number one issue. It, I was stunned because I was expecting what would be the most obvious. But they hit me with another one. They hit you with another one. Mm -hmm. I can think of about 15. I mean, the lack of support they have from administrators. Yeah. I know that's definitely one of them. Yeah. I definitely know that they want to be able to do their job. Mm -hmm. But in some districts, there's disproportionate funding. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about the school funding formula. Yeah. In terms of support from the administrator, support with parents. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't assume that the teacher has the children's best interest. Wrap it up in one anymore. word. Wrap it all up That's in one tough. word. Wrap it up in one word. Support. Hit me with it. Respect. 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 That's true. They want respect. 
They, they, well, that's not a word we, we teach in, in uh, schools anymore. It's, it's leaving the culture. What do you say to a student that watches a politician or two on TV denigrating their teachers, yelling at them, bullying them, uh, basically telling them they're worthless? What do, you, what do you tell your students when they see that? This governor respects everyone. I'll, I'll even respect my opponents. Look, you're not... Do you think there hasn't been enough of that on, in the Christie administration? Well... Do you think he's not shown enough respect? Well, I will say this, okay? And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and respect me on this, okay? Sure. I am not going to comment on the Governor Christie and any politician because they are the past. They are the past. Enough has been said about them. I will address policies, okay? Mm -hmm. But I ask people to uh, look at me based on my past and then look at anybody else you want uh, based on their past, past and then make the decision about character mm -hmm. and about the way we handle things. Uh, I, I think that, we, you know, I've always said when you're running for public office, if you have to spend more time making the other li guy look bad for you to look good, you're not that good. You know, so... There's probably some so, truth to that. Uh, there is. So, I will say in one key respect, though, where I know, and again, like you, I'm speaking to tons of Republicans every day out there in this state. Yeah. Besides the policies of the Christie administration, they may disagree with the gas tax yes. being one of them. One of the most frustrating things is what's happened to the New Jersey Republican Party itself. It's atrophied. It is. Not it that is. it was super strong before Chris Christie came into office, but I've seen it firsthand, and I know others have. We've made no positive steps forward in many counties were taking steps backwards. So even if not on the policy front, I think what we really want to hear is what a governor, Steve Rogers, not just a governor of the entire state, but also leader of the Republican Party in the state, would do differently to put Republicans back on a track to victory in all 21 counties. A couple of discoveries I made during the Trump uh, election. I had the opportunity to go to the Republican National Convention, and I was with the New Jersey delegation. Now, I've got to tell you, I was pleasantly surprised about our state chairman, Sam Rhea, for example, he's the state chairman of the GOP. Guy's a down-to-earth guy. He did a fantastic job in bringing the uh, representatives of New Jersey, the delegation, to the Republican National Convention. But, Matt, to my surprise, those representatives were the middle-class Americans. I was expecting to see all of those people who had all this great influence uh, in this state uh, as establishment politicians. I, I, I was look. I was looking in the mirror. I was surprised, and I got to talking to them. They want change. They really want change. And so here's what Governor Rogers is going to do. First of all, uh, I want to make sure that we have uh, classes in our schools established that will teach our children at an early age about uh, the the process of electing people to office in the state. I want to encourage them to get elected. And this is both sides, okay? This is not going to be a Republican program. This is going to be an American program. Civics. Right, civics. Get, get history and civics, civics back in the classroom. Let's talk about the greatness of our state. But at the same time, here's what you need to do to get elected. I get that question now from thousands of people. They have no idea on how to file petitions, on how to get involved in local school boards. So that has to become part of our educational process. You know, thinking long range, 10, 15 years down the road. So now you've got people who understand the process. For example, people don't know you could run for a local committee seat in your town and get 10 votes and get elected. They don't. They don't. So and you get your start on the school board. Right? That's right. I sure did. So what we need to do is to educate people. All right. Educate them on the process. That's number one. Number two, once they're educated, we make sure that we have a screening process set up. Now I'm going to go down a road that is troubling, I'm sure, to you as it is to me. A screening process set up so that... Before anyone is anointed by the party, let's talk to them. Let's have a screening process set up, but not a screening process set up where you have a panel of politicians interviewing them. You have a panel of people in the community interviewing them. Different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different skill sets. You might have 25 people interviewing them. So you want to diversify county committees. Yes. I don't want to put words in your mouth. And kind of decentralize authority? Is that what you're talking well, about? Well, yeah. Uh, look, at, we're talking about... So, they're make, so, in other words, the county committees themselves are making more direct decisions as to whether or not the candidates being chosen are represented. Exactly. That. Okay. Which leads me to this point. Okay. You're looking at a guy who called county just about every county committee in this state. Right. It's protocol. It's the proper thing to do. Mm -hmm. I had a wake-up call. Because as I talked to these individuals, broke bread with them, broke bread with some of them, and they're looking at me right in the face. We haven't made any decisions yet until there's a convention. Now, yesterday, 
uh, we have candidates who came out with a long list of endorsements and what was so disheartening uh, I'm not even going to say disturbing because sometimes the things get you here when you're sitting across from a person and they're giving you their word that they're not going to make a decision and, and Matt they didn't have to give me their word that they're going to support me I wanted the word from them that it would be fair when you read their name on a list that was just released by other candidates what happened what happened I don't get a chance to sit down and to discuss with you one-on-one -on -one what you're doing with me now so you know what it is what it is it is what it is mm -hmm. and uh, but I'm gonna get around that because I'm gonna be knocking on the doors of all those committee people whether it be the telephone or physically at their doors and let them know that Steve Rogers is gonna be your next governor I know one thing that the folks are knocking on their doors a lot of them care deeply about and we've had problems with this in New Jersey for decades and we could probably have an entire interview just about this gun rights what does Governor Rogers do to move New Jersey forward so the Second Amendment is in effect in New Jersey and not constantly circumvented by our courts and our legislature, which a bunch of unconstitutional regulations? Second Amendment is non-negotiable. Right. All right, it is a constitutional right that should never be negotiable. You'll have a governor leading the charge on that. That's shall the, issue number two. Yeah, yeah. Make New Jersey yeah. a shall issue state. Yeah. It, 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 People have the right, based on the Constitution of the United States, of course it's going to be a shallow issue. But we're going to take it a step further. I'm going to appoint an Attorney General that will absolutely, in total, uh, uh, stop the uh, fight against justifiable need. All right? I don't need a judge uh, or a politician telling me why I need uh, to carry a concealed weapon. Look at terrorism. Look at crime. This is why I need to carry a concealed weapon. Period. Right. So it is a constitutional... They never feel their, the need to have to justify anything of what, what they what, do else, right? That's right. So <laughs> it was a two-way street, maybe I'd be okay with it. But you have a governor right. that just doesn't talk, but he but he walks the talk. Now, 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 of course, we talk about replacing... That uh, sounds like criticism, by this, the way. Well, I'm teasing you. No, 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 I hear you. I hear you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. And by the way, I'm going to be doing this to all four of them. I want to sit great. down with that's them. That's right. So. But, but my point is, is that so you appoint <laughs> justices that understand that their job is not to make law mm -hmm. their job is to interpret law you don't send a, a a order to the state legislature to create a law that fits the the narrative of the justices mm -hmm. should be the other way around so that's the road we're going to go down I'm, I'm committed to making sure that uh, the people in the state have a right to carry a concealed weapon and we're going to make it easy mm -hmm. because when you go for a gun permit that's all you're going to need you don't have to go back for a permit to carry you're going to do one permit, easy process. You'll be able to protect yourself. And I'm also thinking about the Castle Doctrine. I think that is very, very important. And we don't have it here, but that's something that I'm really looking at. This is stuff that some of our Second Amendment readers and listeners will really be glad to hear. I know that there's a lot of them out here, especially in South Jersey. We had a young lady, Carol Bone, who was uh, murdered yes. recently in South Jersey. You may be familiar with this case. She had a restraining order against her ex-boyfriend was waiting for her permit to be processed. Yeah, yeah. Killed in the interim, unable to protect herself. Legislature didn't give a darn. You know, Matt, with the technology we have today, you don't need to wait 30 days. You know, I believe, obviously, in a reasonable period of time, maybe three days, okay, to make sure that uh, we have safeguards in place. One, anyone on a terrorist watch list, right. obviously. Anyone with mental illnesses, obviously. Anyone with a criminal record, obviously. But that's, that's really far and few between. The overwhelming majority of people looking for the right to carry a concealed weapon are, are like you and me. They're legal, law-abiding soccer moms, for goodness And sake. I'll go a step further, because I've had the benefit of working with so many great Second Amendment advocates over the years. I've been invited to speak to some Second Amendment groups. They're constitutional scholars. Yes. It's insane how dedicated they are not to just the rule of law and the origin of their rights, but also safety yes. and the proper application and exercise of those rights. Uh, many of them could be teaching college courses. It really is amazing. They really get a, a bum rap, and I think a lot of it's stereotyping. Because it they is. have a beard, and they wear yep. shirts, and have pictures yep. of rifles on them, it we is. dismiss them. It's yep. one of the last totally accepted prejudices in the United it, it States. Is. You're talking to a future governor who knows full well about terrorism right. and the damage it can do to this state. I would love another layer of protection. Look, right. our police are the best in the country here in New Jersey. Great police. They are the best. But it takes time when you pick up the phone and you dial 911 to get the SWAT teams together and the first responders. They get can't there. be everywhere. They, no, and and you know 
people say, and thank God, most of our police departments respond within two or three minutes. But in that two minutes, there could be carnage. Hundreds of people could be killed. Just take one law-abiding citizen with a weapon, and you know what? You're minimizing all of that bloodshed. Before we move on, I should ask you to explain real quick to the Classel Doctrine, because even though I just talked about how educated our Second Amendment readership yeah. is, not everybody's probably familiar with it. In the simplest of form, if you're in your home and somebody's breaking into that, uh, your home, instead of you running to the next room because you can't shoot them and protect yourself, you could actually defend yourself with a weapon. Easy to remember. Easy. It's your castle. Simple. That's the simple. Yeah, it's your castle. It's your castle. We're, I don't. I usually don't like to talk too much about bio in these interviews because, frankly, we're going to link to your website, your bio, and let people read about it. Um, but you did mention you have extensive law enforcement and security yeah. experience. You also mentioned what a good job our police do in this state, but how many threats they're facing. Not just the conventional threats, but also from terrorists. And we had one incident related to the Manhattan bomber that actually bled into our state recently where local law enforcement did a tremendous job yes. intercepting the threat. What is Governor Rogers going to do to be a better friend of our law enforcement beyond what they've had in the past? Well, a few things. Number one, uh, our law enforcement agencies across the state are going to get the equipment and the tools that they need to do two things. First, and they're doing a pretty good job at this first one, that they're going to need to the, the most... Um, uh, updated tools and equipment to respond to uh, very violent criminal acts and terrorist attacks. I was at a meeting last week, uh, uh, it's here in New Jersey, I won't mention the town, where the police department, Matt, this is going to floor you, the police department does what we call active shooter training. Mm -hmm. it, it sharpens their skills in the event of an active shooter in a school or somewhere. Sure. They had to go to a private fundraising effort to get the ammunition that they need to train. That's a fact, folks, and yes. that's happening all across the state. We are not funding the police departments uh, to even buy ammunition when it comes to training. And by the way, these are things that I just think it's worth saying, not to interrupt you, but liberal, conservative, communist, Martian, we should all yeah. agree. Yeah. Government should be able to pay for the roads, yeah. and it should be able to pay to support fully the people that protect us. Exactly. Protection, transportation, two things anybody agrees government should do, exactly. if nothing else. And we're not doing it in New Jersey. They had hit us up again to pay for the roads, and this is startling information that, I, you know, I, I prosecute, so I've, yeah. I've heard from different towns certain things, but I bet you most of our listeners have most never heard Most of you don't know that. It's amazing. Uh, there was a time, uh, I don't know if there's today, when we needed bulletproof vests. Well, you know what, the state, the, the government didn't want to buy them, they couldn't afford them. So who did it? Companies came forward and they gave us vests. These evil corporations. Yeah, right? yeah. Imagine. We're sending our young men and women into harm's way right here in New Jersey, and we don't want to give them the equipment that they need that could be life-saving. The other thing I'm going to do is, and this is where my expertise as a former military intelligence officer and 38 years on a police department and the uh, commander of the Criminal Investigation Division, this is where I bring all of my corporate knowledge over the years to bear. We have intelligence gaps in this state. And, and, and if, obviously, I'm not going to share with you what they are. But we need to increase our intelligence and information collection abilities. Uh, and, and I know where those gaps are. I know how to do that. Now, why would I want to do that? It's life-saving. When we fill these gaps, we're going to be able to gather more intelligence and information than we're gathering now. And we're going to be able to bring a, a much more secure state with regard to the possibility of a terrorist attack coming our way. And I'd love to tell you what it is, but obviously I can't. But believe me when I tell you, we have some gaps that have to be filled. Another thing I want to do, I want to bring back very, very affirmatively and strongly community policing. I was the author of a lot of the community policing programs that we have in the state of New Jersey back in the late 80s and early 90s. In fact, I was, uh, 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 I was the New Jersey police officer that went to Israel and lectured at the Israeli National Police Academy on the benefits of community policing. And with community policing, you have this bond created between the police and the community like no bond could be made. And when you've got cops out there and they know Mrs. Jones has a cold or Johnny is not doing homework, you become, actually you get adopted by that family. And boy, that bond, what does it do? It decreases tension between the police and the community. And let me add this. In and of itself is fantastic it intelligence. Is. There's no replacement. It, it is. No, no replacement. But let me say this to you. 
I'm asked all the time, what on earth created this problem between the police and, and the community? What, who constructed the wall between the police and our communities, and in particular our minority communities? Folks, I'm going to tell you this. It isn't the minority community that is creating the problems in this state. It isn't the police that's creating the problem. None of those two groups built that wall. Politicians built that wall. The establishment politicians who promised the people in the inner cities and in those communities so much and delivered nothing, and promised the police in this state so much and delivered nothing. They managed to build a wall between us. Governor Rogers is going to tear that wall down, and, and I'm going to make that as loud as Ronald Reagan did when he was in Germany and told Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Well, we're going to tear the wall down because, Matt, we have to start bringing people together. We really do. And the way we do it is just be truthful, just speak from the heart, and let people know that you're for them, not just for this group or that group. You're for them, all of the people. And so I'm going to bring yeah. all of my knowledge and experience to bear to do just that. And, and you, I'm sure you share my philosophy that one of the number one ways you bring people together is not to use identity politics no. and victimization. You elevate people and give them an opportunity for mobility. And one of the best ways to do that is school choice. That's right. And we're That's in the right. middle of a discussion in the state about what to do, not just with the funding formula, which is... Creating a situation where, frankly, we're right down the road from Camden, New Jersey. Right. We're spending twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year, so we have only a handful of kids that are college ready, right. according to their SAT scores. But we're not getting kids all the services they need in other communities, and we're not treating them like equal citizens. I think it's the easily the civil rights issue of our yeah. lifetime. One of the things that John McCain said that I agree with one hundred and ten percent. So when it comes to this issue of the funding formula and school choice reforms, what are you going to do as governor? All right. Now, this is where I get into trouble with the left and maybe some of my GOP colleagues. First of all, school choice, I think, is a necessity. All right. right. But not at the expense of the public school system. I think we could strike a balance where we bring the respect and the tools our public school teachers need. But we should give people the opportunity to be able to lift up, you know, lift their children up and to point them in a direction where that dream will come true. Now, here's the hard part. I really believe that Abbott districts have not served us well. What Abbott districts have done is they have taken from middle class towns and some of the affluent towns, and they're taking the hard earned tax dollars, and which can be used to further progress the students in their communities, and we're giving it to the cities and to the poor districts. Money never solved our problems. So by doing that, think about this. So I'm a parent in a, a poor district and now I'm getting money from Morristown and Nutley and from uh, your community here. I'm getting all this money. Why do I have to worry about getting involved? You're taking care of my kids. And my point is, is, is this. If you stop the flow of money and you care enough about your children to the point that you will die for them, you're going to go to school board meetings. You're going to go to city council meetings. You will do what it takes to get those politicians to do what they have to do mm -hmm. in order to bring businesses and income into your community so that your school districts don't go broke. Money doesn't solve the problem. We've seen it. It's not working. It's not true. working. And, and now, of course, I get hit with, well, you know, if your policy gets passed, poor kids are going to be in a lot of trouble. Uh, they're not going to get the education. You know, you're taking food off the table. Look, it, I'll do anything for kids. But the worst thing to do is to enable cities to lead them down a path where they are never, never, never going to be uh, qualified to go to college or get a skilled job. It's, it's just patching it up. I'm going to put an end to that. And what we're going to do is, look, we're going to help them start, okay? The state's job should be, we'll help you start, and then you take control of it. It goes back to the old theory. You know, you could give a, a person a loaf of bread to eat, mm -hmm. and he eats for one day. Show him how to bake a loaf of bread, you see? And he'll get all the tools and equipment he needs to bake that bread Would you, would you support a system along the lines of what the Christie administration's advocated, where we assign a certain dollar figure to each child around the state, with making certain exceptions, like for children with special needs, in order to equalize the funding? Or do you have something else in mind? No. First of all, I believe that children with special needs, it is our obligation and duty to really fulfill uh, uh, the, the requirements that they, they, they have. That's a whole different story. Yeah. I don't have a problem with the funding that is necessary to help children with special needs. And eventually right. I want to see them integrated into the mainstream. That's very important. Right. Uh, I've talked to parents with special needs. 
it's a bureaucratic nightmare, even to get it help. Is. It is. So, so, so I'm going to put an end to that. But I really, with regard to Christie's formula, look, he's trying, all right? He, he, he's doing something new. But I want government out of it. I really do. I want government out of this. If anything, I would agree to giving municipalities a grant or maybe a loan that has to be paid back. And you take that grant or you take that loan, here's your startup. Now, do what you have to do to rebuild your school district. And when you give people the, uh, the start, but the responsibility to pay that back, you know what? You're going to see them get off their rear end. So you would attempt to basically short circuit the whole system instead of dispersing funding as we do now. And the Supreme Court has interfered in this yep. respect. You want to take all that money back and reallot it in a new way. Yeah, it's not working. But okay. you're reloaded. Matt, if I gave you, Matt says to Steve Rogers. Oh, I don't think it's crazy at all, believe me. I'm just trying to figure out conceptually how well, here, it would work. Here's how it would work. First of all, Matt needs $20,000. Okay. Steve, can you give me $20,000? I said, sure, here, take it, all right? Never have to pay it back. You know what Matt's going to do? Steve, I need another 20000 Sure, no problem. But if I say to Matt, Matt, here's the 20000 but you've got to pay this back at the end of the year, mm -hmm. you're not that quick to come back for the next 20000 what you're going to do, and what I would require you to do, Matt, is to go out and use that twenty thousand, invest it, do whatever you can to make another twenty thousand dollars. Isn't that a biblical uh, uh, principle? You know, it's 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 like you know what I'm giving you something, but I expect something in return. And you know what I want in return? Well, it's, an, it's a venture capital principle. There too, you go. Right? Perfect. So, venture capital. So principle. that's that's more the model you'd set up. Yes. That, you know, instead of having a department of education, there'd be some kind of government mechanism. School districts would make their application it. and be reviewed. Yeah. We have the government mechanism. It's called local school boards. People vote uh, for their local school board representatives. So now you have it on the lowest level possible. Oh, I see. So the money's not even getting to Trent. It's Never the people are paying taxes. The school board local is making board. the decision. Why should it okay. come to Trent? You know, why should it come I to don't disagree at all. Because you know when it comes That's to just a very radical plan. And again, I do not mean that in a mean no, I know or disparaging way. I mean that that's a major departure from what anybody else has proposed. Yeah, so I think that'll be interesting to a lot it's, of It's talking about accountability and responsibility on the shoulders of who? The voters, the parents, the people most affected. Look, as a parent, I, am, I was absolutely sure when my children were growing that I knew what they were being taught. If there were deficiencies in the education system, I would get involved. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to do across the state. Encourage people to get involved. Folks, if you don't get involved, you know what? Your taxes are going to go up. The cities are still going to get uh, it, it become blight. Businesses are going to be leaving. Get involved. That's how we're going to do this. A couple more issues that I know are very important to our listeners, or many of our listeners. Life, okay? It's always a debate in all 50 states, but New Jersey, we're not an exception to the rule. The issue of abortion, which has reasserted itself because we have a Supreme Court battle going on. Also recently in New Jersey, Governor Christie hasn't supported, but there's been efforts to legalize euthanasia in certain circumstances. Where does Governor Rogers fall on these issues? Life begins at conception, period. And then in my administration, there will be no abortions for birth control purposes. And that's what this is all about. I fully understand that, and, and I have two daughters, folks. In the case of incest, rape, and, 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 and uh, the, the life of a mother, I get it. And that's something deep within the soul and heart that people have to figure out. But this state of New Jersey is not going to allow abortions on demand. These are human beings, little, little human beings at conception. That's number one. Number two, I'm going to make sure that we defund Planned Parenthood. Now, I've heard from people, oh, you know, they do the mammograms and women's health. That's fine. That's fine. But so do hundreds of other nonprofits. And many of the services they say they offer, they don't. Yes. They're lying. Absolutely. <laughs> so why should we be involved yeah. and, and support something that is wrong? Now, look, I want to make this clear. Individuals, women who have gotten abortions, you know what? You're not bad people. You're really not bad people. You go down a road and you, you felt that this was the best thing you could do for yourself, then you know what? Then then that's your business. And that's it, takes a, it takes a woman and a man, too, right? Which yes. is the point that I always like to make. Oh, I always say, you have to talk to the per, the father of the yeah, child. Yeah, there's two but, people that should be taking responsibility. But, but to, your point, to your point earlier, mm -hmm. we have to stop condemning people. I, I've, run in, I've talked to women who have had abortions. Toughest decision. Very difficult. But some of them have said to me, if I knew there was another way, 
If I knew there was another way, maybe I would have went down that road. But when it comes to life, you just heard what I said, and, and, and there's no compromise on that, non-negotiable. Totally different subject, but we're trying to get a couple sure. of things in. Casino expansion. Failed on the ballot last year, but the folks that were funding it, many of whom are connected to Democrat donors, say they're going to try again. They yeah. wanted to build casinos in North Jersey. Where do you fall on expanding casino gaming beyond Atlantic City? Well, first of all, we have to rebuild Atlantic City, all right? My, my issue with casinos uh, throughout the state, and, and believe me, I hear the argument, they're in PA, they're in New York. Sure. The issue is, and what you don't hear about, is the draining of resources. The police departments, the fire departments, the first responders, it can end up costing us a lot of money. Plus, keep in mind that many of the casinos around the country, look where they're located, in isolated areas, Poconos, Bethlehem. They're not near cities where you have gangs coming in. One of the problems that they faced in Atlantic City was the high crime rate, prostitution, gangs. The police department down there was overwhelmed mm -hmm. and they couldn't control the problem down there anymore. So I'm more apt to say this. There is casino gambling in Atlantic City. I don't have a problem with it staying there, expanding it. I have a bit of a problem with down the road, if somebody could show me where it will truly benefit everyone, Maybe we'll think about expanding it, but that's why I talked about Atlantic City with the New Jersey movie and film industry. Could you imagine that? Bringing that to Atlantic City, and don't you know? And then you won't have to film Boardwalk Empire out of state. That's right, which Do is right a terrible bit of irony there. Last but not least, because then we can talk about a million topics, sure. and hopefully, as the campaign goes on, we will. And we're also at the short at the moment with our line of discussion. Yes. Sandy victims. It has been years now since that hurricane ravaged the Jersey Shore and parts of North Jersey, and yet there are still people that are not back in their homes, still people that are fighting with FEMA and other federal agencies. What kind of advocacy are you going to provide these folks that they haven't had already? Well, first of all, I'll be the governor that will not just sit behind my chair and talk about it. Uh, I will do whatever it takes. For, it's a tragedy. They didn't have to wait this long. It's disgusting. But I will do everything I could to, number one, make sure that those who are supposed to get the aid get it quickly. But also, a lesson learned. Let's make sure that we have the mechanisms in place, even if, here's where we go with the state again. If you have to go for federal aid, fine, there's a process. Let's make sure we have a rainy day fund here in New Jersey that will provide for those people, that will help them build up their homes again and their lives again within a very reasonable period of time. And then let the state get the money from the federal government. Let your elected representatives fight the feds. You shouldn't be doing that. We should be providing for you. That's how we're going to solve that problem. They should do their jobs. And one more subject, if I may. Absolutely. Right now in New Jersey, the single most important threat to the citizens of New Jersey is the heroin epidemic and the opiate epidemic. Now, in the 1970s, when I was a young police officer, we had the solution to the problem. And the solution was panel discussions, meetings, bringing people in to talk about the problem. And do you know, it didn't work. So we had a bright idea. Our state it's government, shocking, right? Yeah, our state government had a bright idea in the 80s. And you know what the idea was? Panel discussions, bring the experts in and on and on. We talked about the same thing in the 90s. We're talking about it not now. But here is what's going to change. Governor Rogers is going to try desperately to work with our Congress to pass a law that, well, let me just digress a bit. I want to talk about the attic first, then we'll talk about what I want to do. I have, over a period of time, concluded that young people, especially, who are addicted to drugs, they should never get a criminal record, never. It's an addiction. We have to give them a very clear and a very strong pathway to rehabilitation. It should be addressed as a mental health uh, issue and a physical health medical issue. So we must do everything we can to keep them out of the criminal justice system. It's an addiction. Some of their parents are addicted. But everywhere I go, and this happened when I was on a police department, many of you out there were very reluctant to bring your children into a police department in fear that they would get a criminal record. That's going to stop. We're going to get them the help they need. You know what we're going to do? You don't go to a police department. You go to your local health department where there's HIPAA laws and nobody could talk about it once you leave that building. But here's the other side of it. And I look in the camera because I've done it all over the country before I ran for governor. If you are an individual who sells, manufactures, and distributes drugs in this state, I'm talking about opiates and heroin, you better pack your bags now and get out of this state. We're coming after you. I'm going to seek, 
our congressional representatives to pass a law that you will be prosecuted under domestic terrorism laws. And that will mean life in prison. That will mean a whole different level of investigatory tools that will be used against you. And if I can't get the Congress to do that for our representatives, I'm going to get the New Jersey legislature to ensure that if you are convicted of selling, manufacturing, and distributing drugs in the state of New Jersey, life in prison without parole. That's how you stop the problem. Where did I come up with that? From drug addicts, former drug addicts. They said that, that we, we, we've had a wishy-washy approach, uh, a cuddling approach as we're doing with bail reform, and people are dying. The only people who are going to die when it comes to this policy that I'm going to implement are the drug dealers who will die in prison because they're never going to get out. That's what we need to be tough and to be strong and to be determined. And that's what I'm going to bring with regard to that issue. I think Save Jersey listeners, readers, Republican voters this year, they're looking for a contrast. And they're going to have a decision to make in June. And I think if nothing else, you definitely provide a contrast, which is part of the reason I was... So glad to have this conversation today with Commissioner Steve Rogers of Nutley. Um, obviously, there's so much more to talk about, and as the campaign progresses, we want to talk to you more. But in the interim, how can folks that want to learn more and continue this discussion with you get in touch with you? Okay, now here's what you can do. And I shared this with Matt and everyone. I'm going to give you a phone number. So get out your pad of paper, pause this, get your pen or type it, whatever you want to do, put it in your phone. And I'm going to give you an email. Now, you're not going to get a form letter saying, hey, thanks for calling, you know, or a voicemail. You're going to hear my voice on the other phone because I'm going to call you. Now, after I have my uh, nightly Facebook town halls, I get 50, 60 calls, and it takes about a week to get back to everyone, but I get back to them, and they're shocked. They say, I can't believe I'm talking to you. When I make a promise, I'm going to keep it. So here's what I'd like you to do. My phone number, 973-562-6508. Nine seven three five six two six five zero eight. Now I'm going to give you my website where you'll be able to communicate with me, and I'm going to give you my email. The email is Steve S T E V E. That's Steve at Rogers R O G E R S Gov G O V dot U S. Steve at Rogers N J Gov dot U S. The website. Rogers the number four nj.com Rogers the number four nj.com all you gotta do is pick up the phone send me an email you're gonna hear from me not from anybody on the staff you're gonna hear from me Steve Rogers this was a lot of fun hey this is great <laughs> the uh hey here's the the Walter Cronkite of the 21st century and I God said, help us if that's true well I said this to him before I even came here journalism died in America a long time ago the Matt Rooney's of America are resurrecting it. So I would encourage uh, any student, and I did this in the campaign, this is really great. I've encouraged any student of journalism to see what he's doing, and what he's doing is real journalism. And, and I've also done this. Any college student, high school student, who's in the field of jur journalism, call me. You could set up your own press pool, and you could follow us around, and you could write about me. I will not look at what you're writing. I will not look at what you're broadcasting. What you write goes on the air. Internship credit. You may actually there learn something. There you go. God that's... knows you do in New Jersey politics. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. But Matt, thanks so much. Commissioner, thanks thank for stopping so. by. Thank and we'll you. be in thank touch, you. all right? And thank you.